Uh, so we are beginning, okay? All right, thank you, Sumala. Dear participants and all of you who will watch this recording, I'm Federico D'Alessio, and I would like to give you a warm welcome to a new event organized by the Council for Global Cooperation. The CGC is an international nonpartisan forum aimed at tackling global issues through independent research, analysis, and open dialogue. The major projects we have undertaken focus on genocides and genocide and disaster studies, international history and foreign policy, Cold War, and Third War studies. The main goal of this organization is to provide in-depth analysis, raise public awareness about pressing issues, examine the various crises of our era, uh, and provide effective, uh, peaceful and effective resolutions. Within the CGC, I act as research director of the Cold War project. Adopting a global approach to the topic, this project aims to critica, critically, critically in, analyze the political, economic, and cultural legacies of the Cold War, as well as the hostilities that have emerged in its aftermath. Today, in memory of the 50 years anniversary of the Paris Peace Accords that brought uh, the Vietnam War to an end, we are truly honored to host a discussion on the book, The Kennedy Withdrawal, Camelot and the American Commitment to Vietnam by Dr. Mark Silverstone. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Silverstone. Before we start, I would like to call the president and founder of the CGC, Somava Basu, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Federico, and thanks, Professor uh, Silverstone, for joining us today for the book discussion on your recent book, uh, The Kennedy Withdrawal. As my colleague Federico mentioned that uh, today is the 50th anniversary of the Paris uh, Peace Accord, the agreement that ended the Vietnam War. There, could have, uh, there uh, couldn't have been other book discussion today as appropriate uh, uh, as the Kennedy Withdrawal. So it's really a privilege to have you today, Professor. And uh, to our audiences, I would like to introduce Professor Mark J. Silverstone. Mark Silverstone is an associate professor in presidential studies at the Miller Center and chair of the center's presidential recordings program at the University of Virginia. As chair of the Re recordings, program, recordings program, Professor Silverstone edits the secret White House tapes of Presidents John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, and Richard M. Nixon. He is the general editor of the Presidential Recordings Digital Edition, the primary online portal for transcripts of the tapes published by the University of Virginia Press. He is the author of Constructing the Monolith, the United States, Great Britain, and International Communism, 1945 to 1950, published by Harvard, which also won the Stuart L. Burnett Book Prize from the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. Professor Silverstone is a historian whose scholarship focuses mainly on the Cold War, res, uh, res, uh, precedence, and presidential decision making, particularly during the 1960s and 70s. He has written, he has written for journals and edited volumes on the Kennedy presidency, the Cold War, and particularly the American War in Vietnam. He also edits the Miller Center Studies on the Presidency series and is the editor of the famous A Companion to J John F. Kennedy. The Kennedy Withdrawal, Camelot, and the American Commitment to Vietnam is his recent book published in November 2022 by Harvard University Press. So without further delays, I would like to pass on the floor to Professor Silverstone for his opening remarks and to tell us about his book. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Samava, and, and uh, uh, thanks to Frederico as well for the very kind words. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, uh, particularly on today, as you mentioned, the uh, 50th anniversary of the ending of the American phase of the Vietnam War, at least. The war, of course, would continue for another couple of years until the end of April 1975, when the combined forces of Hanoi and the NLF proved victorious. Um, and marched into Saigon, renaming it Ho Chi Minh City, and, and then transforming uh, 
uh, the environment in, in all of Vietnam, uh, consolidating and ultimately founding the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. But the American phase was, was obviously uh, crucial to the entire uh, phenomenon. And that's what I focused my studies on, uh, studies that, that actually began when I came to the Miller Center uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, as I think both Federico and Sumava mentioned, I've spent some time working with the secret wise, one secret White House tapes, the tapes that presidents really from Franklin Roosevelt to Richard Nixon had uh, recorded uh, surreptitiously uh, without the knowledge uh, for the most part of uh, those who were in the room with them or those who were on the phone with them, uh, a process that lasted from 1940 to 1973. And far and away, 99% of all of those tapes were made during the presidencies of John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and, and Richard Nixon. Uh, their taping systems varied. Uh, Kennedy taped about 260 hours of recorded material, mostly meetings. Uh, Johnson taped uh, roughly 850 hours of material, uh, mostly telephone conversations. And Richard Nixon taped 3,400 hours of conversations, combination of, of meeting as well as telephone, but mostly meeting. And I'm happy to, to talk about those um, uh, those developments, those processes, their secret tapes, the differences between the two uh, or the, the three uh, presidencies during the Q&A. But when I came to the Miller Center, uh, we were initially doing work on JFK and working on his Cuban Missile Crisis tapes. And before long, we got a call from a team of scholars, uh, political scientists, economists, uh, who uh, and psychologists actually, who were uh, at uh, both Brown University, uh, the Watson Institute there, as well as in uh, uh, other scholars in Canada, who were conducting a critical oral history on the on the transition between JFK and, and LBJ. Um, what did Kennedy think he was doing uh, when he went to Dallas in 1963 with respect to Vietnam? Where was American policy going? After he was assassinated, and what did Lyndon Johnson think of that policy at the time? What did, what did Johnson then do with that policy after the assassination? Did he believe that he was carrying through on Kennedy's commitment to Vietnam? And then how, if, if at all, did that policy change substantively during the course of LBJ's presidency? Was Johnson simply uh, doing what Kennedy would have done, or did Johnson veer off into a different direction and uh, exacerbate the war? Of course, he Americanized it, but the question was, would, would Kennedy have Americanized it as well? And since we had spent much time with the Kennedy tapes, tapes that had become available to the public, really, uh, as a result of Oliver Stone's 1991 movie, JFK, which put forward a very provocative argument that JFK was assassinated precisely because he wanted to wind down the American uh, a project in Vietnam, the assistance effort, and, and uh, more broadly, to wind down the Cold War, to reach an accommodation, particularly with the Soviet Union, that there was a series of, of um, developments uh, and um, conversations among uh, members of the CIA, the FBI, uh, Cubans, mafioso, who all wanted to get rid of Kennedy, and Kennedy was thus assassinated as a result. And because Stone's movie was so provocative and created such turmoil uh, in the United States at the time that Congress impaneled a, an assassination records review board to comb through American archives to see if there was more evidence to get to the bottom of Kennedy's murder. And some of the evidence that was unearthed uh, included these White House tapes. And so these tapes became available in bulk to Americans in the latter part of the 1990s. Some people had used it. Bob McNamara, in fact, the Secretary of Defense, had used these tapes in his 1995 book, uh, his memoir, really, on his time in Vietnam, in which he kind of uh, apologized, in a way, for his handling of the war. But then we had begun the process of, of really transcribing these in full, 
after our director at the time, Philip Zelico, and his colleague at Harvard, Ernie May, had uh, transcribed a series of tapes related to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the idea was then, let's not stop with the missile crisis, let's, let's transcribe all of Kennedy's tapes. And while we're at it, why don't we transcribe the other presidents who had taped two, LBJ and, uh, and uh, Richard Nixon. And as it happened, the taping regimen began with FDR. So the idea was to do it really comprehensively. So some of the tapes that we transcribed on JFK dealt with this matter of Vietnam, particularly in the fall, the very consequential fall months of 1963. And one tape in particular from a meeting in early October of 63, uh, when the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Maxwell Taylor, returned to Washington after having conducted a fact-finding study. And uh, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about the uh, the uh, history that led up to that study. But when they, they arrive in Washington on the morning of October 2nd, 1963, and present Kennedy with a report of, of how things are going in Vietnam, it's quite arresting to hear what McNamara says, because he says quite categorically, we need a way to get out of Vietnam. And the plan that he presents to Kennedy is a way of doing it. And to stay there when we're not needed, he, he's saying, is uh, essentially counterproductive, and it hurts uh, both both our prospects as well as theirs, the South Vietnamese. And it was fascinating to hear from McNamara, who would later welcome uh, the war being labeled McNamara's war, say to Kennedy something completely opposite that 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 the United States needed to get out. And this notion that that Kennedy was receptive to the idea of getting out has a long history. Uh, it had grown up in, uh, in the, during the war itself uh, in uh, 1970, uh, particularly when the memoirs of one of Kennedy's close aides, Kenny O'Donnell, it was a joint memoir from Kenny O'Donnell and, and Dave Powers and their, about their time with JFK, when they said that Kennedy essentially had a secret plan to get out of Vietnam uh, and that his assassination really put an end to that plan. Uh, and it was a provocative um, argument, but some elements of it were borne out the following year once the Pentagon Papers, that secret study that Robert McNamara had launched in 1967 became available. And, and those papers, it was really a Defense Department study of how the United States became engaged in Vietnam from, from 1945 straight up until the point at which the study was conducted in 1967, indicated that, uh, yes, indeed, there was planning afoot to extricate the United States from the Vietnam conflict by the end of 1965, that this planning was systematic. It had uh, lasted from the summer of 1962 straight through into the fall months of 1963 and that it looked like it was a serious effort to try to wind down the American effort. And therefore, what happened to that plan once Kennedy died? Did it still live or did it die with him and with the emergence of Lyndon Johnson as president? And as we know, uh, Lyndon Johnson in the spring of 1964 essentially reversed the planning afoot to extricate the United States and that if there was a question of American troops and Vietnam, uh, it really revolved around the issue of, of not how to get them out, but how to put more of them in. And so I end my book, essentially the narrative portion of the book in March of 1964, when the Kennedy withdrawal or planning for withdrawal ends. Now it's important to note uh, as, part of this, this broader inquiry into Kennedy and Vietnam, that there's, there's good reason to think that Kennedy had some skepticism about the American project in Vietnam, uh, which would suggest that maybe he really would have followed through on a plan to get the United States uh, out of Vietnam. Kennedy uh, had criticized the American approach to what was then the Franco-Viet Minh War, the war between uh, the French and their allies in the, the 
the associated state of Vietnam uh, on the one hand, uh, doing battle against the Democratic Republic of Vietnam that had been founded in September 1945 by Ho Chi Minh. Uh, your viewers probably know the outlines of that story, but because the two sides, uh, the French who were looking to reimpose colonial control and the, and the DRV were unable to reach an accommodation, uh, skirmishing had military skirmishing had taken place in in 1946. By the tail end of that year, out and out street fighting had erupted, and that launched what would become uh, really an eight year war uh, between the French and Vietnamese forces uh, loyal to the French, or at least supporting the French, and those who were led by Ho and and the DRV on the other side. And that war comes to a conclusion. Uh, with the Geneva Agreements of, of 1954. During the course of that war, then Se um, Representative Kennedy and then Senator Kennedy had criticized the American approach for simply supporting the French without giving sufficient credence to Vietnamese nationalism, the importance of, of that historical thread, and not just for the Vietnamese, but for other countries that were emerging from colonialism. Um, decolonization was well underway uh, by the time that, not only that, that the war broke out, but particularly by the time 1950, when the war enters a new stage following the establishment of the People's Republic of China. And it is really in 1950 that the war becomes further internationalized. Not only does the People's Republic recognize the DRV, the Soviet Union recognizes the DRV, and the United States throws uh, its full force behind uh, the, the, the French project and this associated state of Vietnam led by uh, Bao Dai, who had been uh, a, a monarch prior to World War II and was really a placeholder monarch for the French as a way to rally um, indigenous Vietnamese around the French project and really an anti-communist project. Kennedy had criticized the United States for not pushing the French harder to grant full independence uh, at an earlier stage. And he did that not only when his own party was in power, the Democrats under President Harry Truman, but also when the opposing party, the Republicans, came into power under President Dwight Eisenhower. So Kennedy was very critical about the way that the war was being handled at that point. At the same time, he recognized the importance of an anti-communist Vietnam in the context of a global uh, Cold War struggle between East and West, between the forces of democracy, as he would have phrased it, and the forces of, of slavery, as many would phrase it at the time, particularly somebody like John Foster Dulles who was the Secretary of State for uh, for, for Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Vietnam was the keystone to the arch. It was the finger in the dike. It was the country that was going to hold back the forces of communism uh, in Asia, particularly to thwart ex uh, uh, Chinese uh, expansionist aims and all that would mean for American power in the region, particularly at a time when the United States was still intensely interested in building up Japan as an anti-communist bulwark in Asia. And that is very important in the, at, at the moment in, in, in the late 1940s and 1950s for understanding why the United States is even interested in, in this piece of territory at all and why the United States is interested in, in Korea at all. It, you, know, you are students of Cold War history and it is fascinating that from the American perspective, uh, the United States decides to plant the flag and go to war in a couple spots that are that one would think would be the least likely places that the United States would go to war over, uh, if you're looking at from at it from the perspective of 1946 or 1947, when the heart of the Cold War is really in Europe and uh, over the fate of Germany, uh, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, those don't seem like particularly salient um, pieces of territory particularly if you think about the, the arguments that George Kennan was making and the need to forestall communist advances into uh, the industrialized areas of the world. So Japan notwithstanding and, and the, the, the workhorse that, that Japan was, it, 
it became essential uh, during the course of, of the latter part of that decade that the United States uh, support Japan uh, in its effort to build back up and, and Japan therefore becomes one of the key, key uh, regions that the United States is interested in, 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 um, in bolstering as again, an, an anti-communist bastion. So these are some of the historical dynamics at work when Kennedy is thinking about Vietnam in the early 1950s. By the latter part of the 1950s, as he is gaining a national profile, he will uh, sound a little bit more hawkish uh, and will be supportive of efforts to, uh, to defend this anti-communist Southern Vietnam that emerges after the Geneva Accords of 54. Again, your viewers are probably aware of this, but just to, to highlight, uh, as a result of the Geneva Accords, Vietnam itself is divided at the 17th parallel with uh, a, the, the northern half of, of, uh, of the, um, the region being communist run by Ho Chi Minh and essentially um, a rump DRV and south of the 17th parallel, an anti-communist region run by pro then Prime Minister uh, Godin Ziem with elections between the two sides uh, to decide the fate of a unified Vietnam being uh, mandated by the Geneva Accords of 54. Those elections never happen as a result. Ho decides or, or continues on the progress on the process of building an, a, a communist state north of the 17th and, and ZM an anti-communist state south of the 17th. And uh, and Kennedy is intensely supportive of, of the, uh, the ZM project. At the same time, uh, during Kennedy's early presidency, once it becomes clear that um, the communists are on the offensive, particularly after decisions were made in Hanoi to uh, accelerate efforts to support Southern Vietnamese communists so that they don't get further decimated south of the 17th parallel. Uh, Hanoi will create the National Liberation Front, the NLF, uh, which is a conglomeration of communists, which were uh, clearly in the ascendant and, and running the organization, but also non-communist Vietnamese nationalists too, uh, they, their efforts become much more belligerent, 1960 into 1961. And if the United States is going to prevent the fall of the ZM government, a government that it had supported with upwards of $2 billion of aid since 1954, the United States would need to increase its advisory and assistance effort, an effort at the time that included only 685 US military advisors. That was the amount that was uh, limited uh, by virtue of the Geneva Accords. And so Kennedy agrees with his advisors, uh, particularly Maxwell Taylor, who was at the time his special military representative, and Walt Rostow, uh, the number two person at the National Security Council, they go over to Vietnam in, in the fall of 61 and deliver a report to Kennedy, which is really quite hawkish, in which, it, in, in which they ask Kennedy essentially to make a firm commitment to defend South Vietnam from falling. They also ask for the introduction of American troops and assorted other war-related materiel. Kennedy agrees to the introduction of this material, which will include helicopters, fixed wing aircraft, better intelligence capabilities, better communications capabilities. Uh, Kennedy agrees to the deployment of more American military advisors going in. So by the end of 1961, we'll see um, upwards of two to 3,000 advisors in. By the end of 1963, there will be 9,000 American military advisors in South Vietnam. By the time Kennedy goes to Dallas, there'll be well over 16,000 American military advisors in Vietnam. Again, that's up from 685. But Kennedy uh, does not agree to make a firm commitment to forestall the fall of South Vietnam. And he's pretty insistent upon that. There will be no American combat troops going in, American troops in fully integrated units that would essentially take over some of the fighting, 
from the South Vietnamese armed forces themselves. So Kennedy places some limits on what he's willing to do to save South Vietnam. And in the spring months of 1962, when that American assistance commitment expands, um, a military assistance advisory command is established. So the, the, the very nature of the American presence in Vietnam changes. It is commanded now by a four-star general as opposed to a three-star general, providing further indications of American resolve to forestall a communist victory. Kennedy at the same time says, I still want to be alive to, I still want to be prepared to pull back from this escalation if the situation presents itself, if an opportunity presents itself for some kind of mutual and balanced reduction in fighting uh, and perhaps work out our, our differences at the conference table. That's the implication. Um, perhaps like what had happened in neighboring Laos, uh, which was also contested between warring factions of communists, non-communist, communist and actually royalist factions as well. Um, the decision to neutralize Laos is one of the few bright spots in the summit meeting that took place between Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet um, uh, premier back in June of 1961. There was little interest in doing the same thing with Vietnam at that point because it looked like the Vietnamese were more willing to wage war against the communists. But given Kennedy's remarks in the spring of 1962 and his willingness to, to kind of uh, look for new opportunities uh, to, to pull back, uh, the implication is that the disagreements would probably have to be handled out through diplomacy and negotiations. And Kennedy's interest in diplomacy and negotiation uh, was, I think, very much part of, of who he was and his resistance to using the martial option, his resistance to going to war, I think is borne out by the way he responded not only to Laos, but to the Berlin challenge throughout 1961 and really throughout the entirety of his presidency, by the way that he responded to the Cuba challenge, not only in, in the Bay of Pigs in April of 1961, where he decides not to send in American troops to save the Cuban brigade that was stranded on the beaches uh, at the Bay of Pigs, but also to opt for diplomacy, back channel communications to resolve the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962. So there's ample reason to think that Kennedy was uncomfortable with military solutions, that even though he had not placed a ceiling on American advisors going into Vietnam, that he would have blanched at doing what LBJ had done, which is send in 500,000 American troops to fully Americanize the war in Vietnam, that Kennedy would have looked for another option. And this withdrawal plan that Robert McNamara begins to flesh out in the spring and then summer of 1962 may well have been the, the full expression of Kennedy's reluctance to Americanize the war. At least that's, that's the thinking. At the same time, Kennedy's public rhetoric about Vietnam and also his private rhetoric, rhetoric about Vietnam indicated that he very much wanted to stay tied to the South Vietnamese and their effort to maintain their independence and sovereignty in the face of this challenge that was coming from the NLF, but that was supported by Hanoi as well. And it is a challenge that becomes increasingly militarized over the course of 1962, militarized and internationalized, because as a result of conversations between Hanoi and Beijing, it's clear that the North Vietnamese regime is going to get first the verbal and then the materiel support from the Chinese that they will need to then go on the offensive. And the concern on the part of the Politburo in, in Hanoi, which by not, certainly by 1962, but by 19, uh, excuse me, by 1963, but by 1962, it's clear that a more militant faction led by Lizuan, 
who was a Southern regroupee, is really in the ascendant. And the power of the moderates in Hanoi, led by Ho Chi Minh, is in decline, uh, that there's more interest in taking the war to South Vietnam to win a quick military victory before the United States can get fully involved in the effort. So that's that's part of, of this dynamic as well, as the Chinese um, give their assurance of support to uh, North Vietnam, particularly if the United States is to send ground troops north of the 17th parallel, but they're going to send military supplies as well. Uh, and as we know later in the war, there would be uh, upwards of, of 320,000 Chinese soldiers in Vietnam, uh, the height of them coming in 1967 when there were 167,000 Chinese in uh, North Vietnam, largely uh, uh, tending to uh, infrastructure repair, manning some anti-aircraft batteries and so on. But the point is that, that their presence later and, and then their assurances earlier allowed the North Vietnamese regime and their NLF allies to go on the offensive. So the war in Vietnam really heats up in 1963. The Kennedy administration is still very committed to prosecuting it with American assistance. And that assistance continues to, to, to move through the chain over the course of 1962 into 1963. The hope is that the use or the, uh, the implementation of this strategic Hamlet program, an effort to establish fortified villages in South Vietnam, somewhat like had happened in uh, Malaya during the latter part of the 1950s with British help, would help to secure the populace in South Vietnam. So once um, it was believed that uh, that there would be uh, you know, a loyal, a public loyal following for the, the South Vietnamese regime, it would be easier to, to take on the, the indigenous, commun indigenous communists in South Vietnam. Uh, uh, who were being aided by, by Hanoi. The hope is that this would really prove successful. But more and more over the course of 1962, but really in 1963, there came indications that the South Vietnamese political as well as, as military infrastructure was a shell of what was being presented to the outside world, that the progress that the Americans were seeing was really fictitious. Uh, and then once Ziem decided to take on his political opponents, as he saw them in the form of the Buddhists, uh, the, uh, the dynamic in South Vietnam changed and the relationship between the United States and South Vietnam changed. And so as a result of this Buddhist crisis, uh, the planning of uh, to get the United States out of Vietnam in some ways accelerates. And uh, it is because of the instability, the political instability in South Vietnam that Bob McNamara and Maxwell Taylor go over in the fall of 63, that fact-finding trip that I mentioned at the outset, and they come back and present Kennedy with this report of essentially what to do about Vietnam. The report uh, builds upon a broader comprehensive plan that the United States had, but, but uh, in large part centers on this idea of capping the American commitment and really ending it by 1965. Kennedy accepts that judgment. It becomes public. It's declared to the American people uh, after the meeting is over. By all accounts, it does not go over, over very well. Uh, people are confused uh, because on the one hand, Kennedy continues to talk about how essential it was that the United States aid Godin ZM on the one hand, it's important, very important to prevent communist domination of Southeast Asia. But at the same time, it looks like the United States is, is moving toward getting out. And there's a real tension between those two policies that doesn't really get resolved at all during the Kennedy administration, nor in the Johnson administration, until Johnson ultimately decides to resolve it in favor of making good on that commitment that the United States will not accept a communist victory in South Vietnam. And through the course of 64, when Johnson was really thinking about his presidential prospects in the November 64 election, yes, there is this incident in the, in the Tonkin Gulf in which Johnson decides to launch bombing attacks on North Vietnam, the first time that had taken place in the war. But then 
during the, the winter of 64, 65, and then into 65 itself, uh, movement uh, is afoot to, to deploy American ground troops in Southeast Asia. And uh, that happens in the spring. And then we know by the summer of 65, the decision is made to send in more and more forces. By the end of 65, there are 184,000 American troops in Vietnam. And talk about a Kennedy withdrawal, that's very much an afterthought uh, at this point. It will emerge later when the war goes really bad, particularly for the United States, when there's much more American displeasure with what is happening in Southeast Asia. And people look back at the Kennedy years and say, perhaps had John Kennedy lived, uh, we might have had the benefit of his wisdom, of his prudence, of his good judgment, of his uh, disinterest in militarizing political conflicts. And maybe even Kennedy would have made good on that plan to withdraw American forces from Vietnam. And, uh, and that story about our conversation on Kennedy and Johnson, their differences, and how withdrawal planning played in the years later, that's actually the epilogue of my book, uh, because I think it does play a role in the way that Americans talk about the use of force abroad, particularly in the 2000s, when the United States became uh, once more highly engaged in a political and, and military sense. Uh, in the wars of the 21st century, the post-Cold War world, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I think the Kennedy withdrawal uh, comes back as uh, something of a template for many on how either President George Bush or President Barack Obama should have handled their, their policy choices. So let me stop there. That's an overview of the book uh, where I go. Uh, I can say some more about the argument that I make, what I think Kennedy might have done, uh, and why I think that. But I'll, I'll, uh, I've gone on for about forty minutes, and that's probably enough to to open it up to questions. Yes, uh, and thank you so much, Professor. Like it was uh, indeed a great uh, overview of the book which you said. And uh, for our viewers, uh, this is the book. Uh, of Professor Silverstone, The Kennedy Withdrawal, published uh, by Harvard University Press. Hope everyone would read this. And yes, we would definitely go to the questions to our audiences. I would request everyone to post their questions in the Zoom chat box, and we would definitely try to cover them as, as much as possible as time persists. So yeah, before we go, I would like to ask you a question. Like in your book, you have mentioned uh, two primary schools of thought uh, that have emerged uh, to analyze the historiography of the withdrawal in depth. And uh, one, one, one camp is the cold, cold warrior and the second camp is the Kennedy exceptionalism. So you had mentioned, so this is for our audiences, I would, uh, who are not, who might not be much aware of the historiography. Uh, would you like to shed some light on this, these two schools and how uh, these functioned? Yes. Sure. Yeah. So in some ways, the, these camps track along, uh, historiographical camps track along with uh, thinking about uh, not only the Cold War, about, but about uh, the United States and Vietnam. The initial writing on the United States and Vietnam, what one would call uh, kind of the orthodox school, uh, was uh, very critical of the American approach to Vietnam, again, militarizing a conflict that was at its root political, um, seeing Vietnam through kind of reflexively, um, uh, through the, the policy of, of Cold War containment, which is uh, resisting the encroachment of communism, particularly Soviet-inspired communism, but also Chinese at, at, at any turn. And the argument was really that to see the conflict in Vietnam in those terms was really a misapplication of history because of the indigenous um, elements uh, at work, because of the importance of nationalism, uh, because in some respects, uh, Ho's interest in even working with, with Americans in the early Cold, uh, Cold War period, that because the Americans were so... 
um, blinded by the Cold War challenge that the Soviets pay, um, uh, posed, uh, it saw conflicts all over the world in, 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 in this respect, uh, and therefore didn't, didn't take into account particularity and difference uh, in, in the world. And so that initial camp, that Orthodox camp was critical, and that Orthodox camp by and large also saw a string of American presidents acting in a similar fashion. Um, Eisenhower and then Kennedy both being fairly hawkish. And there are reasons to see Kennedy as a hawkish president. Uh, his policies toward Cuba, for instance. Um, yes, he was interested in supporting perhaps uh, unaligned leaders, the non-aligned supporting uh, uh, neutralist leaders, but only if those leaders were already outside uh, the Western camp. Uh, he very much resisted uh, the move toward neutralism by those who uh, were in the Western camp. Uh, and there are, there are a host of, of examples that, that the Orthodox historians, essentially the Cold Warriors School provide. And Kennedy's commitment to Vietnam being among them, even though Kennedy was intensely critical of the American approach to Vietnam, he still supports it and supports the Cold War, the application of Cold War policies when he becomes president. The other school, the exceptionalist camp, is saying, well, wait a second, Kennedy's actually quite a different figure from Dwight Eisenhower. And he has a much more subtle, sophisticated understanding of international dynamics. He is a student of history and he understands long-term trends and he's not only going to be blinded by the exigencies of the moment, by, by uh, Cold War calculations and, and particularly domestic political calculations and he was willing to do the tough thing, such as not rescue those fighters in Cuba, such as not militarize the Laotian struggle, such as not send the military uh, into Berlin uh, and to, to knock down the Berlin Wall. So that school of thought says that Kennedy was actually moving toward uh, a more Pacific approach to the Vietnam conflict and that he likely would have uh, made good on planning to pull the United States out of Vietnam. So those are the, 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 the two primary schools of thought. I, I think I mentioned that there are a couple of others as well. One which is fairly presumptuous, which took the position that they knew what Kennedy would have done um, and that Kennedy absolutely would have pulled out, not just that trends were pointing in that way, but that that's actually what he wanted to do. And there's some evidence to that in oral histories from some of his key aides, Michael Forstall and, uh, and Roger Hillsman, and even from Senator Mike Mansfield, who had said to the, who had said that in private conversation, Kennedy himself said that he was going to get out of Vietnam, but that he had needed to wait till after the sixty four election to do it. So that's kind of the third school. And then the fourth school, which is the most radical school, which uh, includes the the camp uh, which posits that um, Kennedy was killed precisely because of that, and because he knew that, the forces of reaction in the military, in the CIA, in conservative elements in the United States, because he knew the strength of those forces, his planning to get the United States out of Vietnam would be would include the use of deception, that he would sound hawkish in public to keep those forces at bay, but in private, he really would be working behind the scenes to get um, withdrawal ready so that when the time came in 1965, he could enact that plan. So that's that's the historiography on it. Yes, and uh, like coming to the question, like uh, we know that uh, uh, Defense Secretary Robert uh, McNamara, like uh, he had mentioned later on that the domino theory, which had inspired, I mean, which was the main uh, theory or the model which uh, uh, intrigued, I mean, uh, with, which actually uh, made US to follow the policy of containment. So like, what were the views of uh, JFK on this uh, domino theory? And uh, 
if uh, like uh, where there uh, had had there been some like I know your book uh, talks about a lot of ifs and I mean which had which could have been so like had there been any uh, other model so uh, could could the history of US be something different today? Yeah, it's a great question. So the domino theory, this notion that if a country fell to communism, those countries uh, geographically contiguous to it would also fall, uh, was articulated most forcefully by Dwight Eisenhower in 1954. During the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, at a time when French forces were really on their heels, but it's not as though the dynamics of that model, the domino theory, the notion that uh, changes in the international environment can result in a series of cascading changes. Uh, it's not as though that model was born in 1954. There are elements of it that stretch back uh, to earlier moments in the century. And here I would really strongly recommend, particularly since you're students of Cold War history, Frank uh, Ninkovich's book, uh, Modernity and Power. It's been a while since I've, I've looked at it, but it was an important book for me when I was writing my own first book on the communist monolith, because uh, the subtitle of, of Ninkovich's book, uh, Power and Modernity or Modernity and Power, is on the history of the domino theory in the 20th century. Uh, and the way that it uh, encourages modes of thought. Now, there's reason to believe that Kennedy was skeptical of domino thinking. Uh, we have this from oral histories. We have this from some secondary literature as well. But Kennedy himself, his public comments would suggest that he at least believed in the broad outlines of it being operative if he didn't believe in it being applied really mechanistically, that the notion that the fall of South Vietnam would likely have some impact on neighboring nations, Cambodia, Laos, Malaya at the time, uh, Malaysia thereafter, and then the great fear of, of the dominoes uh, moving on to topple Indonesia as well, if not Australia, and then from Linda Johnson's perspective, all the way across the Pacific too. Now, Kennedy does indicate his belief that the fall of Saigon would have had a ripple effect. Uh, he says so, again, he says so publicly, and, and there's indications privately that, that he believed that as well. I would say, though, that there were efforts afoot, not so much in 1963, but in 1964. And here I would point you to another uh, work of Cold, Cold War history, Gareth Porter's um, Imbalance of Power, which looks at the challenge of, um, of the Cold War in the 1960s in particular, and the way that the United States perceived the restraining power of both Moscow and Beijing and, and saw really opportunities to apply American power, particularly in Southeast Asia. Porter makes uh, one of the more recent powerful arguments, suggesting that American policymakers really did not believe in the domino theory at root, he bases his argument on uh, a study absolutely conducted by Sherman Kent for the United States intelligence community in early 1964, discounting many of the precepts of the domino theory uh, and suggests that the domino theory was used mostly rhetorically and in public to convince the American people, if not other members uh, in in American life, uh, members of Congress to continue to fork over aid for the US project, not only in South Vietnam, but elsewhere too, that it was a rhetorical device um, that they might not have, have believed in sincerely. I will say, just to conclude my remarks here, that the domino theory did not have only a geographic application. It had a psychological application uh, in that, uh, 
not Kennedy as much, but LBJ thought that if the United States did not display resolve and commitment and the key word really credibility in Southeast Asia, that other countries with the allied to the United States, particularly NATO countries, would come to doubt the firmness of America's commitment to them. And so you would see a weakening of their own resolve, perhaps a reluctance to continue to fund their military establishments at the levels that they had been funding, and perhaps a greater willingness to accommodate both Moscow and Beijing in their arguments about what was appropriate in the post-war world for political arrangements. So the domino theory had, I think, both of these elements attached to it. Yes, and also like I have seen like uh, many uh, historians of like Southeast Asia or the third world countries have, fo have focused on, the, uh, who have focused their studies on Southeast Asia. Uh, so they have stated that uh, uh, countries like, no uh, like, uh, like uh, North Korea or the situations in Laos and also the rise of China was a factor that was, uh, that was a very, important and influential factor for Washington uh, in the decision-making while uh, even during Kennedy. So what would, would, would be your take on this? Yeah, I would say that's absolutely true. Perhaps not as much uh, in the case of North Korea, at least in, in terms of the impact on policymaking in, in Vietnam. Um, I think South Korea is important and I'll say something about that in a second. And if I don't remind me and I'll come back to it. But China, yes, absolutely. There was a, a real concern about China as an expansionist power in, in East Asia uh, and a concern that the Chinese were more aggressive and more militant and, uh, and less reasonable and rational uh, uh, than, than the Soviets. Um, we know that there was tension between Moscow and Beijing uh, at this point. It had gone back to the latter part of the 1950s, but the Sino-Soviet split was, was evident to, to all observers at the time, uh, including the United States, who had, and the U.S. intelligence community had done some pretty good work on this, identifying at a pretty early stage its emergence. The question for the United States was, was what to do about that. How do you how do you use those tensions creatively and constructively in the pursuit of American interests? And I'm not sure that they really ever hit upon a, a good um, a good process or or outcome for that. But what it did mean was that the Chinese were going to be more belligerent and more supportive of the North Vietnamese. Uh, recall, I mean, this is this is a, a Chinese regime that back in the 1950s had really encouraged. Uh, the the DRV, the Dem Democratic Republic of Vietnam, to settle the war uh, and to vacate areas that they had controlled uh, throughout North Vietnam. And so there's there's real concern on the part of of Vietnamese elements with what their patrons were encouraging them to do. And there is a power struggle in Hanoi between those who are more supportive of the Soviet line and those more supportive of the Chinese line uh, in, in international relations. And the, the, those supportive of the Chinese line uh, ultimately went out. And because of that, they, uh, the North Vietnamese end up uh, being able to go on the offensive more, uh, more extensively. But yeah, if, if you look at the documents, you're gonna see that, that uh, China looms very large in American concerns because of, uh, of the resources that the Chinese would have at their disposal if they are able to conquer more pieces of territory in East Asia and Southeast Asia, kind of comparable to the fear that the Americans had of the Soviets if the Soviets were able to command the resources uh, of all of those uh, East European communist nations. Um, Kennedy might have been supportive of national communists, but it was uh, it was an open question as to whether those communists really were going to be national communists, or they were simply going to respond to the whims of their more powerful patron. So I would say yes, China was very important. As far as Korea goes, uh, 
The United States had been supporting South Korea extensively since the end of the Korean War in 1953 with thousands of, of, of American troops and, and um, millions and millions of dollars worth of American aid, I think $500 million of aid a year. And as many saw it, including Bob McNamara, it was really a bottomless pit and was unsustainable. And so McNamara, as part of his planning to withdraw the American um, American forces from Vietnam, is using the example of South Korea as a model. We don't want Vietnam to become another South Korea. And that's precisely what's happening now in Vietnam. And that's that's almost verbatim what he says to Kennedy in May of 1963, and then develops further over the course of the year. And there are efforts to draw down the American troop commitment in uh, South Korea. There are efforts to draw down the American troop commitment in Europe as well, and to try to get by with a leaner force, particularly because the capability was emerging to uh, fly people to deploy forces much more quickly. And so you, did, you needed to have fewer forces in place for a forward defense if you had the technological know-how to get them to hotspots around the world through deployment. And, uh, and so South Korea emerges as kind of a negative object lesson for the United States, uh, what to avoid uh, in, in South Vietnam. Uh, thank you so much. And now I would like to go for the audience uh, question of the audiences. Like uh, uh, one of our uh, participants has posted, uh, Adarsh Tripathi. Uh, good evening, sir. We uh, The question is, we all know that the Bay of Pigs invasion was a disaster for Kennedy. And he was thought to be a weak statesman by the USSR, which led to the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. In case Kennedy... Uh, don't get uh, involved politically in North Vietnam, wouldn't it be another setback to his image and it might lead to further trust issues with other East Asian allies? Uh, I'm sorry, was the question about Kennedy and North Vietnam, uh, and, and North Vietnam in particular? Yes, North Vietnam. Uh, well, I, I think there was real reluctance on the part of, of Kennedy to uh, to challenge North Vietnamese sovereignty. I mean, that was really, that really wasn't in the cards for Kennedy, nor for members of, of, his, of, uh, of his administration, other than trying to inflict pain on North Vietnam to convince Hanoi to stop assisting the communists in South Vietnam. I mean, there's, um, you know, if you want to draw a real parallel, but after certainly Chinese forces came in to support the North Koreans uh, during the Korean War, the appetite for reconquering North Korea had vanished. And there was no real appetite for rolling back the North Vietnamese regime uh, in Southeast Asia, there was an appetite for inflicting pain on North Vietnam, again, to stop the North Vietnamese from assisting the South. And, you know, that opens up the question of what was the war in Vietnam all about? Was it a civil war between Vietnamese? Was it an interstate conflict between a North Vietnam and a South Vietnam? Uh, and, you know, all the, the international uh, legal implications of, of that, it was both at the same time in many ways. Uh, you would get figures in, in the Kennedy administration strongly wanting to make the case that the real source of the problem was North Vietnam, whereas others would say, well, even if the North halted its, its assistance, you would still have the problem of numerous and active South Vietnamese communists who were destabilizing the South Vietnamese political situation. And the Ziem regime was proving incapable of stopping them. And that's why the United States started to, to provide greater support. In fact, you know, up until 1964, the problem 
really was with, with what was going on, in, even in 65, with what was going on in South Vietnam. And while support was absolutely coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and even more significant support coming from uh, maritime routes. I mean, that's how, that's how the, the heavier, the weaponry came in. Um, it was still a conflict that had, I think for its energy, the energy was coming from the South Vietnamese themselves. So, you know, just to wind up, there was no appetite for rolling back North Vietnamese sovereignty, but there was an appetite for taking the war to the North. Would Kennedy have done that? Well, he was to an extent through sabotage and covert operations. And those operations lasted from 1961 through 1963. I think that he probably would have continued them into 1964, even though they proved wholly ineffective. I still think that he would have been reaching for anything to indicate to the North Vietnamese that he didn't, that he was not simply going to walk out on South Vietnam and to try to convey American resolve. Ultimately, I, it, it wouldn't have mattered because it wouldn't have stopped Hanoi uh, anyway. We have another question from Yash, and this question is, uh, uh, though the president of the U.S. is the final authority on federal policy making processes of the country, were there any other centers of power, were there any other centers of power in the Kennedy administration who influenced the decision making process and might have undermined uh, president's authority to corner more resources and influence to direct to direct the Vietnam War. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. I would say yes, um, but only late in the game. I think Kennedy had a fair bit of latitude uh, during the early phases of his administration from sixty one uh, through nineteen sixty two into nineteen sixty three to essentially implement policy as he wished, a policy that was devised largely by the Pentagon uh, and not largely by the State Department, which itself had implications for the way the war went. But by the middle of 1963 and the onset of the Buddhist crisis, Congress becomes more involved uh, by holding on to the purse strings. Uh, there was a run up to Congress's involvement, I, I would say in the form of, congressional concern about uh, US foreign aid, the amount of monies that were going to countries in the developing world that were pledged to support their uh, economic advancement, to support uh, a variety of projects, whether it was uh, power projects or education or health, uh, civil administration, American, monies were, were going abroad through the Alliance for Progress in the Western Hemisphere, through, uh, through uh, the Agency for International Development, uh, which was loosely tied to the State Department, through the Peace Corps as well, through the, the contributions of, of American youth largely, um, dispensing whatever know-how they had in coordination with other American advisors. Um, there was growing concern in 1963 that this money was not well spent, that the Americans were not getting a big return on their investment, and therefore Congress should kind of cut those aid budgets. And once the Buddhist crisis hit, those kinds of arguments about foreign aid, as it looked like the United States was now supporting a government that was engaging in religious repression, those kinds of arguments became more powerful. And so one of the reasons that Kennedy wants McNamara and Taylor to go out to Vietnam and deliver a report that offers a way, uh, a way forward in Vietnam, continue American aid, but also indicate to Congress that there are limits to America's support, is precisely so it can respond to these congressional concerns. Uh, 
And you can see it in the documents and you can hear it in Kennedy's conversations that Congress is a, is a real concern for the administration at this point. That is precisely why McNamara and, and Taylor are going out there so that they can then come back and testify to Congress, which they do the week after they deliver this report to Kennedy. So yes, there are other power centers in the United States that start to condition the administration's approach to Vietnam. The American public, um, the press, the fourth estate, not as much. Uh, you do hear voices warning about a new Korea that the United States may be getting in over its head. And the United States does, uh, excuse me, the Kennedy administration is certainly aware of those arguments, is not really happy with them, but tries to counter. I mean, you could make an argument as well that um, the writings of key journalists, David Halberstam for the New York Times, Neil Sheehan for UPI and others, with th what they were reporting about the failures of the Xi'an regime, that that was, that was intensifying public concern about the American assistance effort and ratcheting up the pressure on Kennedy. And I do think that there is truth to that. And Kennedy again and again will talk about uh, these reporters and the problems they're causing. At the same time, he doesn't want American policy be, to be devised by these 20-somethings who were uh, reporting back from Vietnam. So it is a concern. I think the more salient concern is, is that of Congress uh, as opposed to, to those reporters. But they are there and they do factor into the mix, absolutely. Exactly. And we also know that, uh, as you rightly mentioned, that uh, uh, that uh, the American money, the taxpayers' money was not exactly uh, spent in a way which, which should have been. But America did, but USA didn't learn it, its lesson. Like it had also had same kind of operation in Iraq as well as Afghanistan. You had mentioned in the book as well. So these had. So when would US learn, and what would be Professor Silverstone's? Uh, I mean, uh, what to say? What would uh, uh, advice to the policymakers regarding these these sort of uh, operations and invasions and wars? Yes. Well, so it, it's an interesting uh, in, it's an interesting projection into the into contemporary uh, matters. I'm not so sure that the that some of the money wasn't uh, certainly well intentioned, um, if not well spent. So Kennedy's approach was different than Johnson's approach, and Kennedy's approach, I think, uh, was more oriented toward. Uh, helping people on the ground, the, the people to people efforts, uh, particularly of the Peace Corps. But because Kennedy was more attuned to, um, to these broader currents of history, was more attuned to the way that uh, dynamics can be affected through long-term historical changes, he was interested in providing that foreign aid so that it could work on the community level uh, uh, at the grassroots. Uh, and, and yes, absolutely, buy some allegiance to American efforts in the world at large, but also help people where it might help the most, as opposed to the approach of Lyndon Johnson, who thought that the money should really be funneled to, uh, to uh, central authorities in these states, um, various ministries who could then disperse or in conjunction with American business efforts to establish large scale pro uh, infrastructure projects and not necessarily for the money to go down to the grassroots. Those are two, two very different approaches to development and modernization. Uh, and I think, uh, Kennedy's model was implemented somewhat half-heartedly because of, of near-term concerns about the allegiance of, of certain governments. And, and you know, there are there's ample room to criticize him as well. But I don't think that the that the notion of, of foreign aid uh 
should be discounted as a result. Uh, what I, I do think is of concern though, particularly in the more modern era, was the belief that with some changes at the top, the removal of Saddam Hussein, let's say, um, you would have had a, uh, a real um, reconfiguration of power and opportunity in, in that country that would have allowed for the full flowering of uh, a more democratic and Pacific and Western leaning uh, orientation than what we saw. I think there was some hubris. Um, I think there was a failure to appreciate the impact of years of, of Saddam's brutality on the populace, uh, failure to appreciate the domestic dynamics, the cleavages, the rivalries um, that the removal of Saddam would unleash. And as a result, the nation building that the United States then tried to do came uh, upon these shifting sands that were really quite unstable. And so the United States found itself mired in a civil war while it was trying to nation build at the same time. And, and the prospect for doing that successfully is, is really close to nil, uh, as we found out. Uh, the dynamics in, in Afghanistan were both similar as 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 well as different. Um, it's uh, you know, the nation building and counterinsurgency certainly has uh, a bad odor right now. Uh, I think that they are probably uh, those those efforts are likely to reemerge under a different guise, particularly because of the way that Americans like to see themselves. Um, as uh, as contributors toward uh, the the positive welfare of those around the world, but also as the indispensable nation, um, you know, if if you think about the the dynamics in in Eastern Europe right now, uh, it's hard to believe that the Ukrainians would be holding on without the combined forces to be sure of the West European nations, but without the leadership of the United States. Um, and that is something that the West Europeans uh, and Central Europeans would 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 acknowledge. So yes, uh, in, uh, an argument for the importance of studying American foreign relations in America in the world in a Cold War context and seeing how some of these dynamics bleed over in, into the post Cold War struggles. And I don't even know what what you would call the current era uh, following the the wars of of nine eleven, but. Um, but I think that, yes, I would think that there would be more need for paying attention to uh, the problems of, of supporting governments of dubious legitimacy, um, of supporting uh, regimes that themselves are confronting these intense domestic cleavages and conflicts uh, and, uh, and trying to kind of um, diminish one's expectations about what's truly possible on the ground. Exactly, and it's really well explained, uh, Professor, and we are almost at the end of our session, and I would like to ask you a question on, uh, this is a question again by Yash. So why does the credibility of the US as beckon of freedom and liberty as a factor become a major variable in the justification of protracted, protracted interventions such as Vietnam and Afghanistan, even if rational calculations in terms of tangible results may suggest otherwise. Yes. Well, I think particularly in the case of Vietnam, uh, the Cold War struggle had emerged at the same time as the nuclear revolution. And uh, it fairly quickly became apparent, uh, certainly since 1949, when the American monopoly on atomic weaponry dissolved, right? The Soviets explode their first atomic device in 49, 
The Americans explode their first thermonuclear device in 52, the Soviets do so in 53, that the challenge between East and West, between the forces allied with the United States and the forces allied with the Soviet Union, um, if there was to be a head-on confrontation between those superpowers themselves, that ran the possibility uh, of, uh, of, of Armageddon, of a nuclear exchange, and nobody would win from that. And so conflict in the Cold War era would play out in different theaters um, and a variety of theaters, right? There was, uh, there was athletic competition between the, the two camps. There was uh, economic competition. Um, there was artistic competition. Whose system is better? Whose system can provide for the vast majority of people around the globe, including those who were emerging from colonialism, which would they opt for? Which system was in the ascendant? And in the military realm, for control of power and resources, um, the conflicts therefore would play out in theaters other than that of superpower competition. And so if you're going to indicate your resolve uh, to make sure that your side uh, is committed to the battle, is not going to let uh, your allies go down the drain and then force accommodation on the part of contiguous allies, you have to convey your commitment to their defense. And how do you do that? You can do it through a variety of means. You can do it through rhetoric, the continued um, heightening of the role that various countries are playing in this struggle for the hearts and minds of people around the world. You can do it through economic assistance. You can do it through, again, administrative help. Uh, you can do it through uh, military support. And, and, and that's the provision of, of both military advice as well as armaments. And then ultimately you can do it, you can contribute through the use of American troops and fighting power as well. And that's what ends up happening in Vietnam. So it's because of, I think, the bipolar nature of the conflict, but also because of the nuclear revolution that it was important for the Americans, but also for the Soviets, to convey the notion that they were willing to stand by their allies come hell or high water, uh, because not doing so risked their defection and particularly in a bipolar struggle that was problematic from a geopolitical perspective, and then certainly in a democratic context from a, from a domestic political perspective. So I, I would say that's, that's the shorthand explanation for why the credibility imperative was so important. Yes, and uh, like we, uh, as we know, like uh, JFK has always been a model for a model as a leader and as well as for a diplomatic model when, when it came uh, uh, for the crisis, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. But how would you rate uh, uh, Kennedy as a model when it comes to Vietnam or had he been lived longer, how he could have been managed uh, these sort of crisis in USA. So yes, what would be your take on this, Professor? Great. Um, so I think Kennedy's record in Vietnam is really mixed. Uh, even his record in, in Cuba is mixed. I think with respect to the missile crisis, yes, I would say that once he's in the missile crisis, uh, his example is a pretty good model for emulation in his reluctance to uh, to opt for military force, uh, even after he said he would, right? He he said that if if um, if the Soviets or the Cubans, and he was hoping that it was really the Soviets who were manning the anti-aircraft guns. If they shoot at American flyers, we're going to shoot back. And even after an American U two pilot is killed, Kennedy decides not to respond with military force. So. Thankfully, he did that. Thankfully, he was president and was even prepared to, if 
Dean Rusk's memoirs are, are accurate, he was even prepared to use the auspices of the United Nations and Secretary General Utant to have him call for a, a, a very public exchange of uh, Soviet missiles in Cuba for American slash NATO missiles in Turkey, both of them being withdrawn. So yes, Kennedy in Cuba, good. Kennedy in Vietnam, not so good. Uh, I would say that, um, and we can look at a different, and we can look at different moments in in Kennedy's presidency in Cuba. But I would focus particularly on the summer of 1963, when Kennedy decides to re-engage the issue of Vietnam. Kennedy Kennedy engages Vietnam at crisis moments. He does so in the spring of 1961, uh, really at the same time that that he's he's experiencing the fallout of the Bay of Pigs, establishes a task force, um, and, and that task force helps establish the presidential program, the first enhancement of USAID for, for Vietnam. Then in the fall of 61, when it looks like the communists are going on the offensive, they have become much more belligerent, and ZM is, acting, is asking for a bilateral treaty and greater American support. Kennedy doesn't really become very active in, in American policymaking with respect to Vietnam until the summer of 1963, uh, until the Buddhist crisis. I mean, there's a little, there's a blip in January of 63 when there's a battle that doesn't go terribly well, but it's really in the summer of 63 that he then re-engages. And so, yeah, so you can see that this presidential inattention, you can make an argument that that's consequential. I think also because Kennedy was enamored of a task force approach and because he empowered mid-level officials to kind of run a little bit with policy on their own. Constructive, you're, you're getting the best out of, of the people in your bureaucracy to be sure, but because he allowed for that kind of improvisation a little bit, you had this group of uh, people in the State Department, as well as in the White House, decide to indicate to the new American ambassador in, in South Vietnam, Henry Cabot Lodge, that if the Ziem regime did not reverse course and reverse its, uh, its repression of the Buddhists, did not reverse the martial law that it had declared, that the Americans were willing to say to Vietnamese generals who were itching for a coup that we would support you. Now, that was a message that went out to the coup plotters without Kennedy's, well, without a full and frank discussion of the most senior officials in the Kennedy administration about whether this was a wise policy choice. Kennedy is unhappy with that and he calls people on the carpet as a result of it, but he doesn't reverse the policy. And that is essentially the policy that goes forward throughout the rest of, of the autumn, which is a policy that says essentially, if a coup is gonna improve our prospects for victory in, in Vietnam, so be it, let's do it. If a coup is not going to be successful, we won't support it, but we're not gonna stand in its way if it looks like it's going to be successful. And I, I think that encouraged some of the disarray in the administration's uh, policy making that burst out into the public and is another reason why, why Kennedy decided to send McNamara and Taylor to Vietnam because it looked like the administration was really enduring a civil war. You had a, one group that was supportive of ZM. He had his problems, yes but he's been a stout leader uh, fending off rivals for years and years, and we've stuck with him and we should continue to stick with him. And another group saying he is a losing horse. He has been alienating more and more members of the populace. He is failing as, as the nation's ultimate military leader. And if he continues in power, Saigon is going to lose. And that spilled out into the public. And when McNamara and Taylor come back and deliver their report, one of the reasons that Kennedy embraces it and, and really wants his whole government to embrace it is to look like they're solidified. 
So it doesn't look like the administration is uh, is is um, is well put together in that respect. And even after Kennedy announces this withdrawal plan, it's um, it receives a lot of flack in the media. And it looks like it's wildly optimistic. And ultimately, people will start to point to that date and say, you know, that was really a dumb thing to do because you're establishing a timeline. You're, you're telegraphing to your enemies when you're going to leave the field. And that's not smart. And then I would just fast forward into the future when you think about the same kind of deadlines that were imposed in Iraq and Afghanistan those didn't seem to be terribly wise either. So uh, planning for a withdrawal is one thing, but articulating publicly a deadline for your withdrawal is, is quite another. And that didn't seem to be uh, a wise policy choice. And, and you know, in some respects, people were looking back at the Kennedy experience and saying, hey, Kennedy did it. That, that might've been the smart thing to do then. Should we do it in the future as well? So I think that the Kennedy record is mixed. I think his 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 unwillingness to militarize or um, I would say Americanize because he certainly militarizes a conflict and it's a failure on his part, but his unwillingness to Americanize the war is sound. But the procedures that he used for policy making likely could have been enhanced. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, it was a, a great discussion with you today, and uh, uh, it was it was really a nice discussion. And it was really your lecture and the overview of the book was really intriguing for us. And uh, yeah, so I, I would be very interested to know what would be your next research on Kennedy. And <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, first of all, let me say. Uh, so that I make sure I, I do so before we cut out. Thank you very much, not only for the opportunity, but for the great questions and, and for, for your group itself, which, which is admirable what you're doing. Uh, the questions were fabulous. And if it's any indication of where you're headed, uh, I, see, I see good things for you on, on the horizon, no doubt. Um, in terms of me and Kennedy, uh, I've become more interested in Kennedy and Asia writ large. So uh, if I pursue another Kennedy project, uh, that might be its focus. But I'm also still very interested in Lyndon Johnson. And I'm interested in what happens once Johnson decides to Americanize the war in 1965. And I'm interested in the politics of war and, uh, and the challenges that Johnson faced as not only commander in chief, but as leader of the Democratic Party uh, during the years uh, 65, 66, and 67, uh, and certainly 68, but I think the years of 66 and 67 are often afterthoughts in examinations of Vietnam. And so I want to spend some time looking at that. We wish you all the best for your upcoming project, and we would be very, we would be really waiting, and we would be very eager to read your uh, upcoming project as well, just like we are reading the Kennedy withdrawal. So thank you so much, Professor Silverstone, for joining us today. Thanks.